So this is part two of chapter three, cellular form and function. So in this lecture, it's going to be very, very short because I just want to talk about tonicity, osmosis, and of course, diffusion. So membrane transport over here is um, important. You do need to understand what a selectively permeable membrane is, which we're going to talk about when we talk about osmosis. Um, osmol osmolarity and tonicity, um, the importance of them are very, very important as well. Tonicity simply means we're going to uh, deal with hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic solutions over here. So what is a selectively permeable membrane? The plasma membrane or the cell membrane around our cells has a selectively, selectively permeable membrane. What that simply means is going to allow some things to enter the cell and is going to allow things to go out of the cell, but at the same time is going to prevent certain things from coming into and out of the cell as well. Um, this is a type of passive transport. Uh, which means there's no um, ATP or energy involved. Here, you don't have to exert a lot of energy. Um, so filtration, diffusion, and osmosis uh, require no ATP. So when it comes to diffusion and osmosis, what it simply means is that the molecules are going to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So it's, they're going to flow down their concentration gradient. A concentration gradient simply means you're going to have more molecules on one side of the gradient as opposed to the other. So for example, if you have gradient A, it may have fewer molecules. Gradient B may have more molecules. So therefore, the uh, molecules in gradient B are going to uh, are going to flow over to gradient A because you have a higher concentration and a lower concentration in gradient A, if that makes sense. However, with osmosis, osmosis strictly deals with water. Now, water is going to travel through a selectively permeable membrane when it comes to osmosis. However, diffusion, there is no selectively permeable membrane involved. Active transport, um, which is another important mechanism, um, ATP is involved over here. So filtration, of course, um, you guys are going to do that. Blood pressure, how it actually allows um, certain part particles, um, nutrients, things of that sort, ways to get filtered out of the blood. Um, so you guys are going to talk about filtration when you get to the urinary system. Um, in um, Anatomy 202. Um, so you can see that those small molecules such as the water and your solutes, they can actually penetrate their little gaps right here in the, um, the capillary walls and they can actually go through here. However, blood cannot because blood is a little bit too large to go through. And that way, all of these nutrients or whatever you have has to travel through the body in order to feed um, the tissues and the cells and things of that sort. All right, here's simple diffusion. Simple diffusion actually starts on page, um, page 88 of your textbook. Okay. Now, Keep in mind, okay, it's the net movement of particles from a place of high concentration. Particles such as dye would be an example. I often use the dye example in Biology 103 where I would take methyl and blue, drop it in a beaker of water, and it floats from the top where it's highly concentrated all the way to the bottom. You can see the dye moving. And then by the end of the class period, the water is completely colored blue because dynamic equilibrium has been reached. So that's when diffusion stops. The molecules stop moving. So I put dye molecules. It goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Um, the movement uh, is due to the molecules colliding uh, with each other and they're bouncing off each other, which means they're going to disperse um, themselves from high to low. Another really good example I used to use in Biology 103 when I would spray perfume. Um, those students in the front of the classroom, 
of course, there will be a higher concentration of the perfume and they could smell it. However, the students in the back of the classroom, by the time it got to the back, um, they couldn't smell anything but the students probably midway in the um, classroom, they could smell it. It was a faint smell to them because it would go from high to what? To low. So the students in the far back never could smell anything. Um, that will be a great example. Um, putting food coloring in water is another great example. So just the movement of any particle, but it's going to move from a highly concentrated area to a lower concentrated area. So it's going to go down this concentration gradient from high to low. Just remember high to low, the movement of molecules. Okay, so they di the substances diffuse down their concentration gradient. There is not a selectively permeable membrane here, as you can see here. It does not require a membrane. This is where students get diffusion confused with osmosis. Diffusion does not require a membrane. However, osmosis does require a selectively permeable membrane. Okay, substance can diffuse to a membrane if the membrane is permeable, permeable to that substance. Okay, but like I said, normally you don't see a membrane over here with simple diffusion. So that's osmosis. Osmosis is crucial consideration for IV fluids. Osmotic imbalances underlie diarrhea, constipation, edema. So there has to be a balance of water, uh, both intracellular and extracellular. Water can diffuse to the phospholipid bilayers, but osmosis is enhanced by aquaporins, channel proteins, and membrane is specialized for water passage. Aqua means water. Okay, now tonicity, um, osmolarity, and tonicity. Okay, huh. hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic. Now, with hypotonic, the cell is going to swell or burst. Hypertonic is going to shrivel, crenate, or desiccate. Isotonic, the cell is not going to do anything because iso means same. So you're going to have the same concentration of the solute. We're going to talk about 0.9% sodium chloride over here. You're going to have the same concentration both inside of your cell and outside of your cell. So you're going to have 0.9% extracellular fluid, 0.9% intracellular fluid when it comes to isotonic solution. Now, isotonic solutions are very, very important. Our blood is in an isotonic solution, okay, because there has to be a balance there. Um, so that 0.9% saline is what keeps our blood in that isotonic state. Um, it's a source of water, a source of electrolytes, um, and also people that are dehydrated, people that have severe cases of diarrhea, vomiting, or and they have to be placed on an IV drip if they go to the hospital or the emergency room, um, they're going to add 0.9% um, normal saline to the drip. Uh, because it's going to keep that balance because you're trying to bring everything balance, back in balance in the cell. Okay. However, um, with hypertonic, like I said, okay, let's look at this picture here. Okay, hypotonic. You can see that the cell has is swollen. Why? Okay, this is your extracellular fluid right here, which has more water. Inside of your cell, you're going to have less water, okay? So water is going to go from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid, which is going to cause the cell to swell. Now, the cell can also burst as well. Um, if you're using pure water, the cell can pop or burst, okay? So hypo means less than or lower. So a hypotonic, that simply means you're going to have in your extracellular fluid, you're going to have a lower concentration of sodium chloride, but you're going to have a higher concentration of water out here. Inside, you're going to have more sodium chloride, but you're going to have a less amount of water. Remember, 
water is going to go across this membrane. So water goes from, we, let's say we have 90% water here, 10% here. So we have more water out here, which means it's going to go from high to what? To a lower concentration. Same thing as osmosis. We're talking about water moving here. Hypertonic, on the other hand, is going to cause the cell to crenate. It's going to cause the cell to desiccate. It's going to cause the cell to shrivel. It's going to cause the cell to shrink. It doesn't matter. Whatever. So ask yourself this question. How does hypertonic differ from hyper hypotonic? Okay, here's the deal. What's going to happen here? Water's going to move out of here. Okay. You're going to have a higher concentration, let's say 90% water here inside of your cell. And you're going to have 10% in the extracellular fluid, which is outside of your cell. Water is going to go from here to here, which is called, going to cause the cell to shrink. Hyper means more. So hyper, you're going to have... Um, more sodium chloride because it's talking about the solutes over here but I try not to talk about that because it makes it even more confusing so you, you have a higher concentration of solutes out here as opposed to in here you have more sodium chloride out here and more, less water and if you go inside of the cell, you're going to have um, more water and less sodium chloride, if that makes sense. Okay? So just remember, hypotonic, water is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, which means it's going to move into the cell. Isotonic, you're going to have a balance both inside and outside of your cell. Hypertonic. Water is going to move from the intracellular fluid inside of your cell to the extracellular fluid outside of the cell from an area of high to low. Water is going from high to low, whether it's hypo or hyper. When it goes from high, high, well, high to low with hypertonic, that means it's highly concentrated inside of the cell. You're going to have less water outside of your cell. Okay, So that means water is going to flow out, which is going to cause the cell to, uh, to crenate. Carry a mediated transport, primary active transport. Now, uh, when we get to, we're going to talk about the sodium potassium pump, which requires ATP over here. We're going to deal with the sodium potassium pump, which is an anti pore, which simply means it's going to, um, anti means against, okay? It's going to pump sodium and potassium out, and they're going to be going in opposite directions. So, to talk about that and he, this is what you're going to see in chapter 11 okay so I might as well talk about it kind of give you just an overview of it over here this is a membrane protein here okay it's a channel protein as you can see so when we talk about the extracellular fluid you're going to have more sodium ions here in the intracellular fluid you're going to have more potassium ions there's going to be for every three sodiums it's going to be pumped out two potassiums are going to be pumped in. ATP is required over here. This is involved in the sodium potassium pump is critical for muscle contraction. The sodium potassium pump is critical for neurons or nerve cells sending signals to each other. Okay, but you're going to have to need ATP in the process. So Remember that when we get to chapters 11 and 12. Um, vesicular transport, you have endocytosis. Um, endocytosis simply means something is trying to come into the cell. Whether it's a large particle, whether it's some type of fluid, any type of molecule is trying to get into that cell. Um, there are three types of, um, there are three categories of endocytosis. You have phagocytosis. Phagocytosis simply means cell eating. So cells are white blood cells, those pseudopods that we talked about, okay? 
where we talked about the neutrophils, the macrophages, how they will actually use their pseudopods to capture bacteria and eat it. Okay, that's an example of phagocytosis. Penocytosis, the particles are a little bit smaller. So this is called cell drinking. Okay, little droplets are going to be taken in by the cell uh, when it comes to penocytosis. Receptor mediated endocytosis um, is highly a really good example which you guys definitely need to um, be mindful of would be um, the LDL, the low density lipoprotein that's um, associated with cholesterol, hypercholesterolemia. That's what they're calling it over here. So receptor mediated endocytosis, particles bind to specific receptors on your plasma membrane. It's a clathrin coated vesicle. Okay, so clathrin coated vesicle in the cytoplasm, uptake of LDL, the low density lipoprotein. Remember, this is LDL has more lipid, a higher ratio of lipid than proteins in the blood. So remember, this is your bad cholesterol and it's going to lead to. Um, high cholesterol. So what happens with people that have hypocholesterolemia, this is what has to happen. Okay, um, Here you have these little molecules, yellow molecules, they're trying to actually get into the cell. However, there have to be receptors right here on this little um, clathrin coated pit that you see right here. They have to be right there okay on the membrane those molecules are going to attach themselves to the membrane okay um, and that's what happens when you have LDL LDL the low density lipoprotein the LDL has to bind themselves to these receptors right here in order to um, be removed from the blood so once that happens these bind they bind to these little receptors here this little groove or pit is called an invagination is going to form, okay? But you have to have clathrin in order for this to take place, and you have to have this coated pit because clathrin is kind of like an address label. So it's going to bring that LDL in, and then it's going to fold back on it, create a little vesicle around it, the plasma membrane, okay? And once it forms that little vesicle around it, it's going to break down the lipids or the LDL. That's when they're going to be metabolized, once they're inside of the cell. So it's going to remove itself uh, from this little vesicle here, from those receptors, and LDL is going to be metabolized or broken down so you won't have familial hypercholesterolemia, as your um, textbook calls it. Um, so your blood vessels have these LDL receptors, the little purple structures that you see is going to absorb the LDL in the pit, which is this little coated pit that you see here um, for letter number two. And of course, it's going to metabolize it in number three once it gets in inside of your, your, your cells. Okay. Um, so much of what we know about receptor mediated endocytosis, page 94, the last paragraph, comes from studies of a hereditary disease called familial hypercholesterolemia, which shows the significance of this process to cardiovascular health. So we talked about it's a C deeper insight 3.3, where we talked about LDL and of course the HDL.